So this is general rules about uh, building outdoor furniture. And quite frankly, there's a lot, like anything else, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. And in fact, uh, Wood Magazine uh, periodically puts out special publications specifically about outdoor furniture. And a lot of this information uh, came from uh, sources like that. All right. Uh, first, though, we want to talk about woods. Okay, because not all wood is going to survive that outdoor environment. So you want something that's naturally rot resistant if you're going to use a natural wood. Things like cedar. I do have a piece of cedar here. I just bought a little little piece here. And uh, it's naturally rot resistant. This is western uh, red cedar. And I can pass that around. Uh, the red cedar is better. Uh, our aromatic cedar just does not hold up, plus it's hard to get it in dimensional uh, lumber because it's generally small stuff. Redwood, uh, that's a piece of redwood. This actually came off of some uh, patio furniture that was falling apart because the fasteners rusted out on them. But uh, I generally don't buy redwood. It's uh, a little more expensive. Cedar is reasonable. Cypress. Cypress naturally resistant, and I have built some stuff with cypress. Uh, it's not particularly exciting. Uh, the wood grain looks much like pine does. They, you know, as a matter of fact, it's sort of hard to see the difference between cypress and pine, but uh, pine's not naturally resistant, whereas cypress is. And, uh, but cypress will expand and uh, contract a lot. I built a boat when I was about a teenager. My grandfather used to have a lumber company, and he gave me a bunch of cypress and I built a boat and I had to keep it in the water to keep it leak proof because it swole, so, swole up so much that it had to stay wet or else it would sink basically. <laughs> all right. Some oaks, white oak, chestnut, burr, not all oaks. Red oak is not uh, that way but white oak is. Okay. Uh, you probably would never know if you had a piece of chestnut or burr oak unless you saw it being cut. <laughs> but as far as white oak, that's fairly common. Uh, black cherry, black walnut, again, those aren't very common, but you could uh, get your hands on some if you wanted to. All right? Black cherry really grows up north. Uh, black walnut grows around here, of course. And it's not as highly resistant as uh, cedar or redwood would, or cypress would be. Uh, there are some other choices, too. Uh, these are even less common. Uh, I don't, you don't have a copy of this, by the way, but I just mentioned them. Juniper, mesquite, black locust, exceptional. Black locust grows up uh, in the north, and uh, farmers up there cut uh, raw <coughs> logs and put them right in the ground for fence posts. And they last hundreds of years. And you don't see it that much down here. Red mulberry. Osage orange you'll see, but in small pieces. Yeah, is that also known as uh, ironwood? I've, I've heard no. some farmers refer to No, I don't think so, no. no. Okay. Okay. Osage orange again. Uh, we see Osage orange down here, but normally small pieces. All right. And it's such a uh, gnarly tree, in fact, it's hard to get a very long straight piece out of Osage orange. Okay. Mainly used for turning. Uh, Pacific U. I've never even seen Pacific U. You know, and of course those things are also uh, either unavailable or cost more. A mesquite. I don't know if you've ever seen a mesquite tree. They typically don't get very big. You know. Uh, there are some exotics that you can use. Uh, we're talking cost uh, concerns here, though. Teak is mm. very resistant, but it's also expensive used quite often for trim on boats. You see, that's where you see a lot of it, you know, but, uh, and you can buy teak furniture for outdoors, but it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg to buy a piece of teak furniture. Honduras mahogany, that's a little more commonly available, but again, a more expensive. Epe, or EP, however you want to pronounce that, uh, the most common use in this country is for decking. And that stuff is so dense it won't even float. It's, it's denser than water. It'll sink if you put it in, a, in water. 
but it's highly resistant. I'm not sure what the price is. I know it's more than your standard decking, you know. I have I have used some of that. As a matter of fact, when uh, when Jerry first did this class, I turned around and used his uh, bench there as a model and went off and built two others, one out of ePay and another out of uh, uh, Trex. Yeah. And uh, I mean to tell you, you, you go to lift that thing up and you've, you've got an arm load. <laughs> it's yeah. heavy. It's heavy, yeah. Spanish cedar, uh, again, uh, you only typically see that as lining in boxes. <coughs> it's usually not uh, round in dimensional lumber uh, sizes, you know. Although it could be. Uh, green heart, I've never even seen a piece. Uh, on outdoor furniture, lignum vitae uh, is very dense in hardwood too, but generally you only find small pieces of that. Okay, you don't find it in dimensional lumber sizes. So there are some other choices. One of the most common ones and one that I use all the time is pressure treated pine. It actually survives pretty well. You, that bench is a good example right there. You know, eventually the weather will get to it. Uh, you should be aware uh, it's practically disappeared. There's two different treatments there. Uh, chromated copper arsenic is the older stuff. That's been phased out because it's not only got arsenic in it, it's got some other nasty stuff in it. And uh, that's where this old saw about don't use it in uh, raised beds and stuff like that if you're growing vegetables in because it would absorb that stuff out of the wood. You know. mm -hmm. Uh, and that, that's probably CCA here because, like I said, it was built in the 70s. This stuff probably is. However, the new stuff is ACQ, and uh, I know that's built out of uh, that the amine copper quat. I don't know what else is in that stuff. I wouldn't eat any of this stuff, by the way, <laughs> if I were you. <laughs> would be very tasty. <laughs> and I have built raised beds that I've grown vegetables in. No, I will use a, uh, I'll spend the extra money for something like uh, cypress or cedar for that raised bed because I just don't want to take a chance of, and some people say, oh, you're just being overly cautious. Well, okay, it might take 30 years for it to show up, but. It's worked so far. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you do have to be aware of there's different retention rates, and this is how much chemical they put in the wood. Okay, uh, and it's rated above ground use or ground contact, or specifically for foundations and poles that are going to be buried in the ground. It's just a matter of how much chemicals in the wood. That's all it is. But if you're going to have it in contact with the ground, you want something that's at least rated for ground contact. Okay. If you buy it at Home Depot, do you have any idea what the uh, rating is? For? No, they don't usually tell you. You know. Actually, I think the little yellow tag at the end does. Yeah. Conventional uh, <coughs> lumber, like two by fours, that's usually the type four. Uh, the bigger, the, like the six by sixes and post thing, those are typically the point six. Ground contact stuff. Yeah. You can read. Uh, you can find out yourself, but they don't really tell you, you know, you can't, you don't see on the sign or anything. This is ready for ground contact, you know. Uh, other materials, exterior plywood, I, but be careful about that because I brought in a birdhouse last week. I don't know if most of you saw it. I had to replace the roof on it and I put a piece of exterior gray plywood on it. The middle ply was relatively thick. It was maybe an eighth of an inch thick. And that is starting to separate because the moisture is getting into that center piece and it's starting to swell up and crack and whatnot. So you need to protect the edges if you're going to use something like exterior grade plywood from the moisture getting into the edge of the plywood. Mm -hmm. uh, composite materials uh, like uh, normally you, planks used for decking. Trex, TimberTech, there's a couple of others out there. Uh, it's plastic. <coughs> it's wood, fire, wood chips and plastic and God knows what else is in there. You know. One thing about that stuff though, if you try to span a very long distance with it over a period of time, it'll actually sag. Especially if I've, I've seen a uh, potting bench made out of uh, Trex and I think there was maybe three or four feet between the supports on the potting bench, and it looks like this. <laughs> you can see the wave across the surface. You know? uh, don't know how old that potting bench was, but 
that's what happens to it if it's not supported properly. Uh, and, and it also gets worse with heat. If, if the sun is on it and it gets good and hot, that, that's part of what causes it to sag. <laughs> yeah, so I mean if you're going to use that stuff, make sure you've got enough support under it. And I would keep it out of direct sunlight if I could. You know. mm -hmm. I generally don't use it. So. Uh, some advantages of using uh, naturally resistant woods versus uh, uh, something like pressure tree pine. Uh, it's a better appearance and quality, generally speaking. Uh, in fact, uh, probably teak is the high end of outdoor furniture. But like I said, that's expensive stuff. Uh, less twisting and cupping and bowing in general. We all know about pressure tree pine. Sometimes called propeller wood. <laughs> <laughs> Disadvantages, it's more costly in general. Tips for selecting natural wood, use heartwood. That's the most uh, resistant, rot resistant is the heartwood, not the sapwood. Okay, so you'd like as much heartwood as possible if you're going to use a natural uh, wood like uh, cypress or cedar or something of that nature. That's, that's also more prone to twisting, isn't it? What, the heartwood? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it's any more so than okay. anything else. Okay. Avoid flat sown wood if possible. Ha <laughs> ha. Right. <laughs> Uh, if you can find quarter song, that's going to be great, you know, but uh, again, take something like uh, white oak. Flat sown white oak is less expensive than quarter sown white oak, but quarter sown white oak is much better to work with because it doesn't twist and warp and sh like, you know, like the flat sown does. Uh, I see a couple of confused looks out there, maybe I should explain what that is. You look at the end of the board. A flat sawn piece, you can see the end grain goes like this. Thank you. All right. A quarter sawn piece, though, if you look at the end, the grain will generally be running like this. It might be at some slight angle, but it'll generally be running like that. Okay. The reason it's more expensive, you can only get a few quarter sawn boards out of one log. All right. You can't get that many. You get up, there's a version called rift sawn, and rift sawn looks more like this, namely there's an angle to those rings, but there's a limit on how much of an angle is allowed in a riff sawn board. <coughs> Best, better, this stuff will cut for sure. All right. In fact, which way is it going to cut? A lot of us know that answer, but uh, the, it's going to go this way. <coughs> All right. So if you're building a deck, which way you put those boards? Yeah, down. down. Yeah, you want the smut, you want it frowning at you. <laughs> All right. Why? Because when it cups, the water will run off of it. All right. Whereas if you flip it over and it cups, the water's going to collect right in the middle. And that stuff will rot faster and you can even pressure the rot out in the middle here. You know? <clears throat> Avoid boards with the innermost 10 or 12 rings. And uh, this is easier said than done too, especially with the larger dimensional stuff. But it, like this is common with four by fours. If you look at pressure treated four by fours, the pith will be in there somewhere. In fact, it might not be centered. It might be instead of being centered, you might see the pith, but the pith might be over here somewhere. You really want to avoid that situation. I've had an entire piece break out. Uh, with the corner like that before, mm -hmm. after it weathered, you know. If you do have the pith in there, you want it right as close to the center as possible. But if you look at 2x4s and 4x4s, I don't think I have an example, you'll often see the pith in that board, you know. I wouldn't, I would try to avoid a 2x4 entirely with the pith in it. 4x4s, you can work with them. Uh, Low density woods such as cedar, redwood, and cypress will resist uh, warping better. I had a piece of cypress, but I didn't bring it. I already passed around a piece of cedar, I think. Yeah. Uh, had some cypress, but I can't, couldn't find it in my shop. I know I got some out in my uh, garden shed, but it's underneath a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> so I wasn't about to pull it out. Yeah. One thing about cypress, uh, it does not weather uniformly. 
and so it looks spotted to you if you're going to let it weather naturally. We'll talk about uh, finishing before we're done too though. Pressure treated pine. Uh, it's readily available. Generally it's cheaper. I'll put a question mark behind that because uh, uh, the price goes up and down, you know, like a yo-yo. So, uh, but it's generally readily available. Disadvantages is usually wet when you get it. And it's usually in a bundle. And it's got mm -hmm. a lot of weight on it. Take a board out of the middle of that bundle let it dry. You'll find out what I'm talking about when I talk about propeller wood. Once it's dry, it's not going to be straight anymore. <coughs> Guaranteed. Twist, bow, and cupping can be excessive. Hence the term propeller wood. Right? You'd like to have it as dry as possible, and you, uh, but that's not always possible to get it that way. Uh, sometimes some of the pieces are relatively dry, but you've got to sort through the stack to find them. You know, besides which, if it's going to be outside, this bench is wet now. It's normally not as heavy as it is, but due to the rain, it's wet. And there's no finish on top of that, so uh, it it's eventually is going to start warping. All right. Uh, this is a good example, by the way, if you get a chance, these boards are riffs on them. How did I get that? I sorted it through the pile, you know, to avoid the flat sewn stuff. But I couldn't find a quarter sewn, but I could find riffs on <clears throat> Jerry, are you going to cover uh, what kind of finish, if any, to put on outside stuff? Yeah, I will. Okay. Yeah, that's at the end. <coughs> avoid the heartwood if you're going to use pressure tree or pine because it does not absorb the chemical. Sapwood does, all right? And what you'll see, and I don't have an example here, the hardwood will, in a pressure tree pine board, will appear pink. You've seen the boards before, it's got pink strip down the middle, that's hardwood. <coughs> and the hardwood does not absorb the chemical, okay? <clears throat> if you're using plywood, seal to cover all the edges. I already mentioned that. So that you don't, you protect it from moisture. Okay, let's talk about fasteners. Uh, generally, you want to use hot dip uh, galvanized nails if you're going to use nails. Okay, uh, not electroplated. Have you ever seen the roofing nails? They're real shiny. They're electroplated uh, zinc, <coughs> some sort of galvanized coating. They don't last. They don't hold up if they're directly exposed. Hot dip. They actually take a steel nail and they dip it in the, uh, the molten metal and they just pull it out, basically, okay? Now, I brought these as examples because these came out of this top. And so they're like 35 years old. They're hot dip galvanized nails, you know. And they are actually still in relatively good shape. Uh, sometimes you'll uh, damage the coating as you're driving them and those tend to rust if you the coating flakes off on you, okay? You can use stainless steel, same thing. Stainless steel is the best, but it's also the most expensive. You can book, walk in a hardware store and buy stainless steel screws, but you're gonna pay for them. Silk and bronze, I didn't put it down here, but that's used by boat makers, and it's even more expensive than stainless steel, but both of those are extremely <coughs> resistant to corrosion, okay? More commonly, decking, screws, well, I, I skipped over uh, decking or ring shank nails. Ring shank nails, I had some and I meant to bring them. If you ever looked at them, they're used, the shank is not straight like this. Well, of course, hot deep dip galvanized is not straight anyway, but it'll have a series of ridges around the shank that actually protrude a little bit. Those nails will hold better and hence they're often used for uh, siding and stuff like that. Uh, probably the most common ones you see is paneling nails or ring shank nails. But even for paneling that you put up in your house because they tend to resist pullout better. In fact, if you put a, something together with ring shank nails and then you want to take one out, mm -hmm. I can tell you that's a real royal pain to get that thing back out. Yeah. Back out if you tried to get it back out. Uh, there is a form of this uh, called decking nails that are, have a spiral shape to them. Again, 
what did I do with that now? You got a relatively straight shank. But uh, if you look at it closely, there's an, uh, a spiral that goes all the way around. And I'm showing the back side too. And it's not that severe uh, cause curvature to it, but they also tend to hold better. And hence they're often using de uh, to put down decking. Uh, screws. They hold the best. You want to use hot dip galvanized screws. If you're going to use galvanized screws, you can get them. Again, stainless steel or silicon bronze, but those are more expensive or polymer coated. This is much more common. You can walk in your big box store and buy polymer coated screws. Okay. They are not all made alike. It's a function of how much coating's on there and how well the coating is adhered to the screw. If you drive one of these in pressure treated pine and it removes part of the coating, it's going to start corroding immediately. Right? You can buy high end uh, screws with like ceramic coatings and stuff like that from people like McFeely. And uh, they uh, will generally last longer, and, but they're also <coughs> more expensive. You could use brass. Uh, brass, though, is extremely hard to drive into a hard piece of wood. So you would limit it to uh, softwoods, you know. You could use copper. Copper is even softer than brass. So. So, you know, if you have trouble driving that kind of screw into a piece of pressure-treated pine even. You don't think a pressure-treated pine is that hard, but just try driving a brass screw or a copper screw into that stuff sometimes. <coughs> uh, Zinc-coated, generally not recommended. You can buy zinc-coated screws. The problem is that coating comes off very easily, okay? And I have used it in outdoor furniture before, and then within a year it'd be rusted. Even the head, which was not really, the coating was still <coughs> intact when it was driven, would start rusting after a year or so. So the zinc coating comes right off. In it. Other types of fasteners, and these are generally, I'll show some examples. Uh, Oh, this is just showing the different types of zinc coatings. You don't have, I mean, uh, it's coated screws. You don't have that handout. Or silicon, or different materials, silicon bronze and stainless steel are the best, okay, but you're going to pay for them. But the other rest of them is just the other coatings that people use. Some of these coatings are proprietary, like Mephili, I know, has a uh, group of uh, coated screws that are proprietary that claims better than anything else on the market. I don't know, could say from. Uh, personal experience, but they also charge you more for those. Okay, these are relatively inexpensive. They're Home Depot or Lowe's. I don't remember where that one came from. Uh, be aware, though, when you're using the screws, most of them have a Phillips head. I can't tell you how many of them I've backed out and thrown away because as you drive them, you cam them out. You know, especially with a power uh, driver. You know, it hits a knot or something like that and it just strips the top right out. Again, you can get square or star drives. Uh, again, <coughs> people like Mephili sells a square drive. They don't cam out like that or they will, but not as much. You're more likely to break the screw than cam it out, you know. So, I say a few choice words, back it out. <laughs> 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 yeah. For both nails and screws, pre-drill the holes, okay? I didn't advance my slides. Yeah. Pre-drill holes, you don't have to. In fact, some screws will, will come with a little uh, slot cut in the end that's supposed to cut the wood itself as it's being driven, mainly for decking again, but they can be used for outdoors. But uh, if you're driving a screw and if it's anywhere near the edge of a board, and there's a good reason that these boards extend beyond the end of the bench. If it's if it's within an inch of the end of that board and you don't pre-drill it, it's gonna split it when you drive it, you know. And you've given Mother Nature an edge once you split that board. <laughs> Does that go with nails or screws, Jerry? Both. 
I, I pre drill nails too. Uh, with nails though, what I typically do is use a drill size that's a little less than the shank size of the nail. Uh, so there'll be still be some resistance, you know. You, in other words, you don't want the nail to just drop in the hole. You know, it's not going to do anything. And uh, I violated one rule I'll talk about later on, but I accidentally drove these. I, the boards have actually swole some, but you're not supposed to drive them below the surface unless you're going to plug that hole. Glues. Okay, you can glue stuff together. Oh, uh, this is not in your handout either, I don't think. Relative cost, uh, and don't take this as absolute terms. Cost per thousand, I put this together maybe uh, four years ago, so prices change. But relatively speaking, galvanized or coated uh, screws and nails are the cheapest. Stainless steel generally is about two to two and a half times the cost. Whereas silk and bronze is about twice the cost of stainless. Okay. Generally, uh, as I said before, you only see boat builders using silk and bronze. And the uh, reason for that is if it's going in salt water, mm. silk and bronze is actually the best. All right. All stainless is not alike. Some stainless is made out of 304. That's just an alloy. 304 does not like salt water environments. Whereas some are made out of 316 stainless steel. If you're going to put it in salt water, you want to make sure you got a better quality stainless steel screw. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> these, these will experience a, a special version of uh, corrosion called stress corrosion cracking. Uh, it's, it's a micro-mechanical thing, but uh, if it's exposed to chlorine of any sort, like even in a pool uh, with chlorine environment, those things will start cracking uh, along, uh, looks like crazing around the screw, you know, or the metal, and uh, eventually it'll just fall apart. So just be aware that there are different kinds of stainless. Glues, you can use glues on, wood, on outdoor furniture. I generally don't, although occasionally I will. But you should be aware there's different varieties of outdoor uh, glues. There's waterproof versus water resistance. What is the difference? Well, the government actually tests this stuff. There's a type one and a type two. The criteria is right there on, uh, I believe I did give you that sheet. Type two is subject, type one is subjected, uh, has to pass a much more rigorous test. It's actually repeatedly dipped in boiling water. Whereas type two, and it has to survive that, so many, uh, so much exposure to that. Whereas type two is repeated, uh, is dipped in room temperature water. Okay. <clears throat> but, you just need to be aware of what kinds of glues uh, you typically would use. Uh, waterproof or water resistant and uh, what the difference is. Typical uh, exterior grade yellow glue, uh, PVA glue like Type Bond, Type Bond 2 or Type Bond 3 is actually a Type 2. Okay, It'll hold up uh, and generally it'll hold up to uh, anything you're going to see here, but if you were really in uh, severe weather environments, you might not want to use that. Okay. Epoxies. There are two, uh, some epoxies are type 1, some epoxies are type 2. They're highly resistant to immersion in water, so if the stuff's going to be exposed to water a lot, uh, you want to be sure it's a uh, type 1 epoxy, and boat builders use epoxies quite a bit. Okay. Uh, I don't see a lot of home use of those kinds of things. But one thing about epoxies, and I failed to mention this about exterior grade glue, exterior grade glue will not fill a gap. If you got a rough surfaces coming together, it won't fill that gap. Okay, whereas epoxy can. And you can also use epoxy to join something like metal to a piece of wood. You know? Or to a piece of wood or something of that nature. Yeah. 
Um, type one, type two, is that actually on the actual label itself? Uh, generally, you, yeah, you have to look for it. Yeah. I mean, it actually is listed though on the. Yeah, I'm not sure that's true of all glues. In fact, the, the Home Depot, they're not going to know either. No, no, they're not going to know the difference actually. Uh, usually, what you're looking for is something that's marine grade. Mm -hmm. There are marine marine grade epoxies, for instance, and that would be a type one. Whereas something even from Rockler or Woodcraft would probably not be a type one. It'd probably be a type two. You know. If you go to Type On on the website, it'll yeah. detail the difference between their Type On two and Type On three glues. Yeah. Just to uh, which is important to hold up on. Yeah. If you really got to fill gaps, though, uh, while we're on that, uh, what a lot of people use is on the next page is polyurethane. Polyurethane will expand once it's in the joint, and it'll fill significant size gaps. Yeah. Okay. But also come out of your joint, so you've got some cleanup there afterwards, okay? Because the stuff goes everywhere, all right. And then while before it cures, trying to get that stuff off is a or also a royal pain because it sticks to everything that touches it, you know. Is it like Gorilla Glue? Yeah, Gorilla Glue is the most common uh, variety. But it's not as strong as as the glues. Not as strong as epoxy. Uh, generally, might be as strong as PVA. You know, the yellow glue. There's a gap. That foam part is weak. Yeah, the foam the, because it's partially air. Yeah. Uh, you be aware though that you can't glue two dry pieces of wood together with polyurethane. There's got to be some moisture in the wood, or it will not cure. You know, you could let it sit there for a week, and if you pull it right apart, yeah. Could you wet it? You can wet it. A lot of people do that. They wet the surface first, and then put the. That was with what kind of glue? Polyurethane. Okay. Best type one glue is called resorcinol. It's actually called resin glue. Okay, it comes in a can. Usually, it's a dry powder, and you mix it with a solvent of some sort, usually water. Okay, and when that stuff dries, though, it is hard as a rock. Okay, so you you want to be sure that you got the joint together right. Uh, but it also takes longer to cure. Generally, it takes like overnight for it to cure, you know, so you have to keep it clamped together for a longer period of time. Uh, it can be dark, as a matter of fact, quite often they are dark red or dark purple, so if you're using it with light colored wood, you're going to see that stuff, you know. But again, uh, marine uh, builders quite often use that glue, uh, <coughs> but it's still available. Yeah. I don't see a lot of home use of that again. It's more industrial use than home use. You know. There are some other glues out there, but they generally aren't it's designed for uh, outdoor use. Uh, uh, you know, stuff like rubber glues, contacts glues, those kinds of things generally aren't designed for outdoor use. Okay, some design tips. This is when you're starting to put together stuff. Allow for drainage of water, especially off of a horizontal surface. Like for instance, uh, if you've got uh, individual boards, you want spacing between these boards, and you can see it here, and you can see it here, because again, you don't want the water collecting on that surface. You want it to be able to drain off as much as possible. Okay. <clears throat> the amount of space is not important, but you want enough space that if that board swells, it doesn't close up the gap. And it will. I don't care what kind of finish you got on that, and we'll talk about it. They'll still expand and contract. Okay. So you can't keep all the moisture out of a piece of wood. I'm sorry, you just can't. Use tongue and groove or shiplap joints if you got a large vertical surface. And what I mean is, if you're covering siding, is a good example. That's a big vertical surface that's exposed to the outdoors. Okay. And it generally is painted or something, but I'm talking about you've got a surface and you've got horizontal boards running like this of significant span, you know, in the vertical direction. You don't want to butt joint these things. If you butt joint them, you're going to get gaps, okay? Because again, you can't prevent that stuff from expanding in contraction. 
contracting. So you'll get gaps, so what do you do? Uh, most siding is cut this way. It's either got a, uh, a joint on the end like this, and the next piece of siding comes up underneath it like this. I don't see that as much as I see the tapered siding today, and you've seen it on cedar siding. <coughs> that's what's called a shift lap joint. All right. Typically, it would be thin at the top, and I'm exaggerating here, deliberately exaggerating. Thin at the top, but then it'd have the same kind of joint at the bottom. And of course, what you do here is you overlap these boards in the same way, but you might wonder why I bother with the taper. It drains better. The water just naturally cascades off of uh, that tapered shape like that. However, having said that, I've never owned another house of cedar siding. <coughs> First one I ever had was here was cedar siding. You're always repairing that stuff. Not to mention that the woodpeckers love it. And, <laughs> and they'll knock all the there'll be knots in there and they'll knock all the knots out of there and everything, you know, and it'll twist and bow, especially today's stuff. If you look at it, this edge is not more than I bet it's not even a quarter of an inch. I've never even measured it. It goes down really thin, you know, and that stuff will crack and warp. I'd only recommend hardy plank anymore. <laughs> it's made out of concrete. Oh, uh, also, if you're going to do this, you also want to generally caulk the joints with some exterior grade caulking. And again, that's just to prevent migration of water into. Uh, this space in here. After after it's put on, you caulk up under the. Now generally, they're going to be the caulking down here before they put the next board on. Yeah. Not all contractors do that, by the way. Most of them don't. Matter of fact, it's too much work. Yeah. Too much expense. Yeah. Well, what about treatment of the joints on the ends, where the end grain uh, is? Generally, you, what uh, is done there is you have a. Uh, a board that covers the end. Look at your siding on there. Well, I'm talking about a, a long span where you can't uh, can't help but have a joint. Oh, you would like to caulk that joint. Yeah. Okay, just simple caulk yeah. on a yeah. butt joint. Yeah, if you got a bunt joint in here somewhere. Yeah, yeah. You would typically want to caulk that joint. Okay. Okay. Especially if you got masonite siding. Anybody got masonite siding? Paint the ends and then caulk it. Yeah, you better do that or else it's going to fall apart. When masonite, when masonite siding gets wet, you can crumble it in your hand. You know? uh, again, if you got it, I'd, I'd take it off my house if I could afford to. I actually have it on my current house. I've had to replace some of the boards and I replaced them with hardy plank when I did, but I didn't replace the entire siding. Uh, minimize exposure of end grain, especially on the top or bottom of vertical pieces. Uh, you may have seen this before too, uh, and they don't generally do this with fencing. You got a pressure tree post buried in the ground, okay? Not to mention the ground contact issue, <laughs> okay? Because this thing extends below the ground, and right? you'd like the most resistant wood possible that's going to be buried, or else put some protection on the bottom of that post. <coughs> People do put creosote on the bottom of a pressure treated post, you know, for instance. But up here, and they don't do this, the rain comes down, rain collects up there, that's end grain. It loves end grain. It'll suck it right into the wood and that top will expand more than the rest of the post will. Vice versa, then it, it contracts and so it cracks rapidly. What you'd like to do, as a minimum, and I, I have to admit I haven't gone out there and done that on my fence, but you want some sort of cap and it could be just a board across the end with the grain of the board running this way. And some overlap to prevent the, uh, so the water would go off this edge and this edge and not run down the side of the post, you know, because if it ran down the side of the post, uh, like you cut the board off here, it runs down the side of the post, goes right in the crap. Yeah. You haven't accomplished much unless you got that overlap. 
They make metal caps for posts. Those work fine, you know. Or they even make them out of plastic. It's just how many of those are you going to buy to put on your fence post, you know. But if you're making a piece of furniture, uh, you will notice that there is no end grain exposed on the top surface of these that's covered with something. There is end grain sticking up here. Like, for instance, in this piece here, the grain's running that way, all right, on that piece. And the, so the top edge of this is end grain. But there's a board up across covering the top edge for that. Done deliberately. Hey, Jerry, the, yeah. the caps that you, you were talking about are you know, plastic or, or metal or whatever. Are they very expensive? The metal ones are. I can't remember. I priced them at one time. Uh, they're just stamped metal, you know, uh, so they're done cheaply, but they, they won't like four bucks a piece for them or something oh, wow. like that last time I priced them. Plastic ones, probably half of that, you know. You're just as well off getting, like I say, getting yourself a piece of birch tree pine, cut a little board, put it on top of your post, you know. Cost you a lot less, maybe a little more time, but a lot less. However, the caps do have a better appearance. Just a question of how much money you're going to spend, you know, to cover that in. Uh, some other design tips, sound joint design. For overlap pieces, you typically want to use a dado or a rabbit or a half lap joint. And reinforce that with screws or lag bolts. Uh, let's see, I don't, oh yes, I do have an example. It's cut in an angle, but this piece is let into this piece with a dado. By the way, that makes a very strong joint. It's at an angle and it's uh, dadoed into this piece. And uh, because of the angle, all and because of the dado, it's a very strong joint. Hence, it's lasted 35 years. You know, for butt joints, use longer. Uh, uh, screws are uh, lag screws. It's not really a butt joint, but it is in a sense. It's, it's uh, because it's mitered at a 45 degree, but I don't always do that. You might have one piece running all the way across and another piece just coming up to it and butting up against it. You just, if you're going to drive a screw through there, you just want a longer screw than you would normally use. Anybody know what the rule of thumb for screws is? Should be equal to the thickness of your material. Uh, take the thickness of the material that you're driving it through and at least uh, twice that length. Okay, so three quarter inch piece of wood, you'd want a one and a half inch screw in general. Okay, that's just a rough rule though. That's not a hard and fast thing. Like most rules, it's made to be broken from time to time. But joints, I would probably use a uh, uh, at least a three inch screw on a two by four and maybe more, I think. Driving three inch screws in pressure tree pine, that's a joy, especially the Phillips head screws. Oh yeah, another thing about that. Sorry, I'm just thinking about these things that I'm going along. You got a butt joint like this. and you're going to drive a screw through here. What you want to do is drill a hole, pre-drill a hole through this part that's big enough that that screw will actually, you can actually push it through that hole. Okay, because the threads are going to go in here, but you don't want, what will happen to you is if this, this is too small, the threads will catch in this piece, and you sometimes you can't pull both pieces together. You'll have a gap in there. So you uh, generally pull that pilot hole big enough that that screw will just drop in there. You don't want it too big, of course, but just big enough that the screw will go in there. That's true of furniture design in general, whether it's outdoor or indoor. You would like to pre-drill this pilot hole so that the screw goes right into it. And that's so it won't jack the boards apart when you're screwing it down. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It's happened to me before. You know, if you drill that, this this hole too small, and the uh, threads catch in that hole before they do the other piece. 
Use locked rabbits or spline miters for corner joints between vertical pieces. Well, okay, I've, I've mitered these, but I didn't do anything to them. What they're talking about is uh, use a lock joint here or, or put a spline down through there, and I did not do that, but these pieces do separate, and the gap that's there changes as a function of the weather, you know. So far it hadn't been a real issue, although I have developed an issue with that bench and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. If you're going to join long pieces together, use a scarf joint or a uh, finger joints. Scarf joint is nothing more, more than a long angled joint. You got a couple of pieces of woods that can expand the distance that you want, but not one single piece. If you cut what's called a scarf joint, and generally they recommend that this ratio be 12 to 1, the angle, all right? So you got a lot of glue surface, and you'll glue them together. What's 12 to 1? What? What is 12 to 1? The length over the thickness. It should be 12 to 1. Okay, again, that's not a hard pass rule, but general thing. What might be better, and you see this on uh, small, like 1 by 2s at Home Depot or Lowe's, because they make them out of scrap, finger joints. Look at the one by twos on the rack at Lowe's or Home Depot. A lot of them have finger joints in them. All right. Okay. All you're doing is, in, in both cases, increasing, increasing the glue joint surface. Okay. So it holds better. I recommend staying away from either one as, as much as possible. Uh, I don't make any furniture over eight feet long, so I can get eight feet long pressure treated pine every, all day, every day. You know. Uh, what did you use to cut that joint with, Rick? This? Yeah. Router bit? They make them. Matter of fact, they, they have them out here, you know. It's also used, you'll see it sometimes used in furniture construction, you know. Uh, so, yeah, you can get a router bit. Now, you don't have this particular uh, slide in your handouts, but this is just showing some things I was talking about. You want to allow for circulation of air and water. So uh, the one in the top uh, left up there is two boards with styles between it. You don't want to block that area in between those styles. You'd like the water just go through there. All right. Whereas right below that is a, and I've got this on my garden bench, is a horizontal piece of two by four with a uh, dado down the center of it. And the styles go in that dado. Well, the problem with that is it traps water in there because the dado doesn't go all the way through the board. Okay, They're suggesting you glue uh, spacer blocks in that dado to cover that gap. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. I just went between the styles and drilled a hole to the bottom so that every little pocket has a hole in it and the water can run out of uh, the hole. <clears throat> Should have brought that. Second point there, pre-drill holes avoid splitting for all fasteners, whether the screws or nails. We talked about that. Softer wood, cedar in particular. If you're using a power driver, use a low torque setting. I have driven a screw right through a piece of cedar before. In one side and out the other. The head, I'm talking about, all the way through. Uh, it was only because I wasn't watching what I was doing, you know. Uh, and it will. It's so soft, it'll just push it right through the board if you're not careful. Unfortunately, I don't have a uh, power driver with a variable torque setting. I got a much older one, and it doesn't. So I, I drive it until it's almost seated, and then I slow down. You know. Oh, excuse me. I meant to turn that off. Allow for shrinkage and swelling. We've talked about that. Watch grain direction for connected pieces. Uh, Sorry about that, I just forgot to turn it off. What they're talking about here is this kind of situation. I got one board with a grain running this way, 
I got another board coming in here that's attached somehow, and the grain's running that way. Recipe for disaster. Why? Uh, the, this board wants to expand and contract this way. This board wants to expand and contract that way. And, uh, and it does not expand and contract as much along the grain direction as it does uh, laterally to the grain. So if these were hard fastened together, it's, it's going to be an issue because it will uh, tear itself apart, that joint will. You can get away with this with indoor furniture because the moisture content is not changing that much. Okay, And you do see that kind of joint in indoor furniture, but you don't want to avoid something like that. What you'd want is to give it room to expand and contract however you design that joint. While you're on that issue, what would be a better better joint to use? Probably a half lap with some additional gap on each side, you know. Okay. When I say half lap, I'm talking about if I turn this board upside down, okay, I would cut into there a pocket. It might go all the way through the board, but I would cut a pocket <coughs> in there and have this other piece lap, uh, lap over that. This pocket would only go halfway through the thickness, but the other piece would come in like this. And I'd give it some additional space on either side. You know, so hmm. when it expanded, it wouldn't push it apart or try to push it apart. <clears throat> and then you'd put screws or whatever in that or glue to hold it together. You know. Hmm. Uh, finishes. Natural finish means just let it weather. I don't have a good example of that, uh, but it'll turn silver gray. You've seen the barns that aren't painted. That's the color you'll get eventually, you know. It will split and crack over time. You can't avoid that. If it's not, and it's got no finish on it, it's going to split and crack, you know. Eventually you'll have to, in fact, uh, the board I passed around wasn't originally painted. You know, it was just naturally weathered. Uh, I lost track of these pieces of furniture for a while and they were painted and I, I didn't paint them, but uh, they were naturally uh, weathered originally. Be aware not all wood weathers uniformly, uh, like Cypress is the one that I'm aware of. It looks spotted, you know, it won't you, uh, weather uniformly. It'll develop a spotted look. Hmm. Leopard wood. <laughs> <laughs> Minimize ground contact. You can see a little bit of this uh, on this on these feet. It's not real bad, but it has had spent some time directly in contact with the ground. But uh, that will accelerate any deterioration of the wood. Uh, I have it sitting on the patio now, so the patio is made out of uh, well, concrete papers, you know. But that's a better environment for it. Even if you want to set it out there in the yard, you might put a brick or something underneath it so it's not directly in contact with the ground. If it's on concrete, what about those little round uh, metal things that drive up in the bottom instead of having it? Oh, you could do that, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Spacer or something. You just want to make sure whatever you use is corrosion resistant, you know. Use those little things like you put on indoor chairs, they're not going to last yeah. very long, you know. <laughs> uh, opaque coatings. That's like a paint or solid color or stain. This stuff is actually not a paint, it's a solid color stain that's on there. Uh, you can buy them for decking, mainly they're used for decking, you know, and whatnot. Will you stain the rest of that? Eventually. After it dries, good. One of the reasons it's not stained, it's only been on there a short while, if you're gonna use pressure treated pine, you want that stuff to weather three to six months before you put any kind of finish on it. Number one, it's wet when you get it, all right? And you don't want to put a finish on it then. Number two, you sort of want that surface to develop some roughness to it before you actually put that, the coating on it, you know, whatever it is. I've seen people put paint directly on pressure-treated pine. Might have been dry, but it might, uh, and after, it'll start flaking off after a very, very short period of time. 
you know. Uh, if you're going to use a paint, use a primer. And the reason for using a primer is every one of these, well, I guess I got some fairly clear wood here, but no, maybe. Oh yeah, there's a couple in here. Knots. There's a knot, there's a knot. And the only ones I see, they'll bleed through your paint. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Big time. Okay, You'll see that knot underneath the paint because it'll bleed through. And unless you put a primer coat on it first and then put your paint on it. Mm -hmm. You can use a latex or enamel. Use at least two coats over the primer coat. So you generally want three coats, a primer coat and two coats of whatever the finish is. Uh, you can use clear finishes and you quite often, oh there's, you don't have that, but that's just showing one coat of primer, two coats of paint. Clear finishes allows the natural wood to show through. They're generally oil-based stains, that's what they are. You see them on decks again, you know, and you can get them colored up to a certain point, but you're going to see the natural wood and in in this kind of finish. Uh, you can use a film finish like uh, varnish, polyurethane, or epoxy. If you do do that, make sure it's got a UV blocker in it, ultraviolet blocker, which by the way is nothing more than particles of silicon suspended in the material, okay, that's what it really is, but it prevents some of the sun's rays from going through, okay. and so it's the Spar varnish is uh, marine grade varnish. Yeah, with UV. Yeah, with UV protection. Yeah. Used on uh, uh, mast and uh, booms for sailboats, and <coughs> hence the term spars. <laughs> Spar varnish. That's where it came from. However, be aware it does not expand and contract with the wood very well. The big drawback. If that wood does expand and then uh, contracts again, you'll crack that finish. Mm. And once you've cracked it, the wood will, the moisture can migrate through it, okay? And adhesion to early and late wood is not the same. Uh, I don't have a good example here. The dark streaks in here are early wood, winter growth. The light streaks are summer growth, all right? Every piece of wood has that, most obvious on a piece of pine. And uh, it doesn't take the same, you know. If you have to repair such a uh, coating, you have to actually sand it down to uh, before you put a new coating on it. Works better when protected from direct sun. Something like a porch <coughs> swing. Fine, you could use a varnish or polyurethane on a porch swing if it's underneath a covered overhang, you know. All you have to worry about then is maybe what part of the day the sun's shining on it and how long the sun's shining on it and that kind of stuff. You know. Story on that. I have a porch swing and I varnished it. I forget how many years ago I made it. But one arm hits the sun. I've refinished that one arm three times. Three times. <laughs> The rest of it's okay. So even, though it's, so even though it's protected from moisture, yeah. the sun still and the spire and all that. Yeah. Yeah, that that would happen, yeah. Others oil based finishes, that's more like a stain. Uh, okay. It's the least costly and it's absorbed into the wood. It expands and contracts with the wood very well and it can uh, contain UV blockers but does not necessarily contain UV blockers. Uh, I'll talk about this in a minute. The only drawback to all base finishes is they don't last as long. So, uh, some other finishing tips, all UV blockers are not the same. Uh, the only way to know this is uh, experience based. I cannot tell you which ones are better than others. You also, if you're staining, you want to use a, I'll make sure you maintain a wet edge on your brush because you want to get enough stuff on there that it absorbs into wood very well. There's a good reason though, again, for not putting, trying to put stain on wet wood. It will not go in there, you know. That stuff's got to be dry when you put that stain on. 
and they're uh, water-based and oil-based. Uh, if you've got rough uh, wood and it's not finished, uh, the oil base works better just because you can get it in the crevices and creases better. You know? uh, I don't, did I put this one uh, in there? Oh, this is just an example. No, that one's, that's showing the difference between uh, uh, the upper uh, left is an untreated uh, un, uh, piece that's new. This is weathered, typical. Okay, and this was various uh, finishes on it, oil based stains or a solid color stain. No example there of paint. Okay. Life expectancy. How often do you want to refinish this? Okay. What's your center? <laughs> well, you're talking about weather based finish. <laughs> Let it uh, change naturally, okay? But you're going to have to be replacing boards from time to time. Uh, spar or marine varnish, okay, uh, six months to a year. Uh, remember, you got to say in that before you can actually uh, repair it. No. Water-based repellent, uh, preservative, uh, like uh, deck uh, stuff, one year to two year, and I wouldn't say that. I would, uh, I think that's over-exaggerated. I think you'd have to retreat that at least every year. Penetrating oil one to two years, and again, I would say I would do redo it every year. Semi uh, transparent uh, stain, uh, they say three to seven years. This, this is exactly that, it's not three years old. Well, it might be three, mm -hmm. all right, but it's certainly not much older than that, and you can see it's uh, coming off. Could right. you just go ahead and put another coat on there now? Yeah, you, you can put another coat on it. You won't have to sand it. Yeah, I'd, I'd work to the middle of summertime when this dries out because it's wet, you know. Uh, you don't have to uh, sand it down, though. Solid color, uh, yeah, and paint, seven to ten years. Boy, you better do a good paint job if it's going to last seven years. <laughs> yeah. Is any kind of oil better than another for outside preservation? No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. They do make teak oil. I've used it before. I don't. It's more expensive. I don't find it to be any better than anything else, any other commercial product. You know. uh. <coughs> cost again. Uh, these are relative costs, so don't uh, go by the actual numbers up there. Water uh, repellent preservative uh, is the least expensive semi-transparent stain and I did not mention this about that that tends to block the grain by the way you don't see the grain in the wood as well uh, is the next uh, in the line solid uh, paint or solid color stain is uh, more expensive spar or marine varnish is more expensive than that and penetrating oil is even more expensive uh, but we're talking about penetrating oil that uh, is designed for outdoor use. We're not talking about stuff like uh, men wax Danish oil, you know. Although that's not cheapest stuff in the world either. The only thing about that that uh, needs to be talked about, and we already did talk about it, maintenance. For a water repellent preservative, generally you just clean it with a detergent and reapply it. Uh, again, they make the deck cleaning uh, materials, you know, that you can spray on uh, and uh, let, it, let it dry and then reapply it. Spar marine varnish, and this is true of epoxies too, I should have included epoxies. Clean it, <coughs> sand it down, and then reapply it. Penetrating oil, again, clean with a detergent and reapply. Semi-transparent stain, clean with detergent and reapply. Paint or solid stain, Clean and reapply if there's no flaking. <coughs> if there's flaking, you got to take get those paint flakes off of there. Scrape it, sand it, and then uh, reapply it. Okay. Uh, the only other things that I got to show you real quickly, okay, because we're running late, is uh, this is a uh, potter's bench I made for my mother, and in Florida. And that's about the most severe environment short of Key West you're going to get in North America, okay? 
Uh, that's what it looked like right after it was finished. Okay. Again, there's no finish on that, and even today, there's no finish on that. What material is that? Pressure tree pine. Okay. It's just wet right after the rain. You know? So it look, might look like it's got a finish on it, but it uh, doesn't. Uh, this is my backyard. That's a trellis, and the reason I'm showing that is to show you some fastener details. And in the background, you see the bench that I'm talking about, was talking about, that's eight feet long. And where I was talking about having the drainage problem is, you see this vertical spindles here? They sit in a uh, uh, dado in this top piece and this bottom piece. But the top piece is not a problem because the dado is upside down. All right. Bottom piece is a problem because the dado is facing down. <coughs> so in between every one of those spindles is a hole drilled for drainage and no other reason. So do you have a scoop? Going up or what keeps them from going sidewards or anything like that? I'm not sure I understand. Okay, you but you have a screw screw going upward into Spacing. the bottom. Spacing. Oh, no. There's the nail. A nail? One okay, nail. So you have a nail on one side, a hole on the other, a hole right next to it? No, the holes are in between. The spindles themselves are oh, nailed oh, in. What you're saying. So you can see the holes then? Yeah. Okay. The holes are halfway in between, okay. roughly. I didn't okay. measure it. <laughs> no, close enough. I you did it it, no, no, no. I started at the top and drilled it. As a matter of fact, it doesn't go all the way through that piece. That's a two by four. It goes down at an angle and out the back side of the two by four. Okay. Uh, that trellis is actually quite old, and I have a rose bush uh, planted there. Uh, this is winter time, so you can't see the rose bush. I've got a better picture later on, but the reason I brought it is. Uh, and there's another view. By the way, I've got two of these benches. There they are before I replace the top. That's one of them. Okay. This is a vertical piece, and let's see, a cross member. My own previous there? I can't. Here, let me hit escape. Can we back up? It's not working from here. Maybe, maybe I don't have the mouse close enough. Uh, that's okay. I can't even get the keyboard to activate. All right. Shoot. Okay. Mm. That piece is this piece running across here on both sides. It's a horizontal piece. Can we put that back in the uh, slideshow? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually closed it. How'd you get it activated? The desktop. Yeah. Should be able. It's right there on the desktop. Just go. That looks okay. 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 No. The little screen right here. Click on the little screen. No, no, you had it. That one? Yeah. Double That's click on it. That's what I just had up. Uh, yeah, right. Go ahead. Bring it back up. Double click on it. Okay. See the little screen right there? Little icon that looks like a screen. Scroll down on the side to your there you picture go. you want. Okay. I don't think you want Susie Tyndall's presentation though, do you? Oh no. Is that, no, I don't. I, that's what I was trying to get across. <laughs> okay, I thought you brought up the uh, outdoor furniture one. You had it up at one time. There yeah, it is. Scroll down to the bottom. So you scroll down to the, the slide I was on. There you go. Okay, back up further. Uh, no, even further than that. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit further. Well, up here, right there was where we were at. Okay. All right, now put it in slideshow. Yep. Okay. No back. Yeah. Sorry, I tried to back up so you could see what piece I was talking about. I'm talking about that horizontal piece that's halfway up the post there, you know. And uh, that is set in a dado and uh, joined with two lag bolts. Again, a lag bolt is a screw, it's just a big one. <laughs> Pre-drill that outside hole so the lag bolt will go through easily, okay, before you start screwing it into the back piece, all right. But you see there's some additional gap there, and uh, I think that wood was wet, and I think it fits snugly when I put it together, but it doesn't any longer, all right? 
but you can't be concerned about those kinds of things. It's not. There is a joint at the top, and uh, note this is hard to see, but that top horizontal piece and the uh, horizontal piece running the other way has a uh, half uh, joint like this, halfway through each board. Okay, so it overlap they overlap each other. And then uh, there is a, uh, if you're going to be doing structures like this, highly recommend you put <coughs> braces on them like that. That's a 45 degree brace running between the vertical piece and the horizontal piece to prevent racking. That's just, that's a piece of two by six or two by four, I forget, that is uh, cut out with a jigsaw to give it that scalloped look but then it's attached with uh, a screw running up through the uh, into the upper piece but again you can see some uh, 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 lag screws up in here okay Th those are hot dipped out, uh, hot dip galvanized this vertical piece coming up through here it's hard to see here there's a cap on top the caps there because that's end grain There's that bench again. Oh, this is a bridge that I built. And this, uh, I'm going to run through it real quick, okay? Uh, I wanted to build an arch bridge to go over. I've got two ponds, an upper pond and a lower pond with a stream bed in between them. I want to be able to walk over the stream bed, you know? Give it uh, a garden bridge. And this is pressure tree pine. That's a two by eight, I believe. But I'm going to cut an arch out of here, and I'm using a very thin sheet, uh, piece of molding, trim molding, mm. with nails to get the shape that I wanted, okay? And I cut that out, and then I took that piece and put it on top, okay? Now I put it on top, I've uh, joined, glued, in this case, the top, the piece that came out of the bottom went on the top, and it's glued with uh, Type Bond 3, all right? Plus, I put a couple of screws close, relatively close to the end, just to make sure it was held together. And there's the completed profile for one side. You see the Type Bond 3 sitting there. Here's the uh, foundation of the bridge. So, what you were seeing is the two outside pieces, all right? And then I put uh, uh, joists, sort of, so to speak across uh, a space every so often that way but then I also want to nail uh, decking on there so I also have curved joists running the length of the bridge and they're attached with toe nail uh, screws in the sides going into the uh, horizontal pieces. It looked like you sistered some decorative uh, material to the outside I certainly edges. did. <laughs> okay. Because when you look at this bridge, it looks like it's made out of cedar. Okay. I covered the outside with cedar boards, cut to the same profile. Okay, and you can barely see it here. That's actually cedar uh, facing. That's on the outside of that, so you don't see the pressure tree to find. Hmm. Me. Okay. And the posts, by the way, are joined with carriage bolts. Carriage bolt is actually stronger than a lag bolt because it goes all the way through. And I can use them here because it's going to be hidden. So you get a washer and a nut on the backside, and you can tighten the heck out of that. Matter of fact, you, you can tighten it so hard you can pull these heads through the front surface if you're not careful. Are the posts cedar too? Yeah, the posts were cedar. Yeah. That's a close up. I have a backer block behind there, you know, just to strengthen this joint with the uh, carriage bolts going through it. There's the finished bridge. and. Like I said, it looks like it's all cedar, but that base is uh, pressure tree pine. How heavy was that before you moved it? That place? I was able to move it by myself. Really? Yeah. It wasn't that heavy, you know. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, one thing I want to show here: uh, these these pieces here are really decorative, more or less. Although they do support the handrail up here. The handrail was made out of laminated pieces of uh, cedar. There's no pressure tree of pine in there with three pieces of cedar laminated how you, together. How did you attach the cedar boards to the pine? Screws. Just screws? You can't even see them unless you go up close. Yeah. Yeah. 
But one thing I wanted to see these uh, pieces here that support the handrail, look down here. Mm -hmm. If you don't use the right fastener with cedar, it will cause staining. Right? And these were supposedly designed for cedar, but they obviously didn't work too well, did they? <laughs> If you really want to avoid that kind of thing, you use stainless steel. You know, mm. for any uh, wood with uh, tannic acid in it, uh, cedar, cypress, uh, white oak. You want something that's going to resist that. That's what causes it. It's the tannic acid in the wood that's causing the staining. How about the uh, boards that you walk on? Are they cedar as well? They have cedar. Yeah, they're white one by fours. And there's the whole thing from a distance, okay? And there's the rose bush in full bloom. <laughs> okay, I have some other things, but I'm not going to bother with them. Uh, one of the things was I went over how I built this bench, and I'll just roughly tell you in a few minutes, okay? These are one by fours. I mean, four by fours, okay? And uh, the only thing unique about them is I ran them through table saw and chamfered the corners off of them. So it looks octagonal, you know. That's for nothing more than the looks. Could have been done with a router if I didn't want that big a chamfer. I could have run a router a bit down there. Yeah, it's hard to tell, but these are, uh, have tendons that go up inside, so this piece actually goes flush against the, these two pieces. So I, I cut uh, a uh, mortise on this side and a mortise on that side so the piece would actually fit up underneath. Okay. Yeah, it might be more obvious on one of the other joints. Okay. Yeah, good idea. So. Also, oh, now this one's heavy. Looks small. Uh, here you can see where it's actually overlapping. Right. And it overlaps on the other side too. Only because that makes a stronger joint. And it's joined to these side pieces with uh, three inch long screws. All right. I know that you can see those screws or not, but they're, because they're covered. There's only two screws, and there's two screws over here. Now, the, the uh, slats actually set in a rabbit. I uh, rabbited the top edge of the, both of these pieces and this piece, and they sit down in that rabbit. Okay, and I, then I ripped some pieces for the uh, slats themselves. When you're doing this kind of thing, I've been through this several times, you need to know the entire length that you're going to cover, what's the width of each piece, and how much gap are you going to leave. Because <laughs> right. you have to adjust this to get a uniform look. And once I figured that out, I, I cut myself two spacers. And the spacers are nothing more than maintain that gap. Put one board on, put the spacers in there, put another board on, put the space, move the spacers down. But if you don't figure that out, you're going to get down here and you're going to go, uh-oh, I only got half a board width left. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons I brought this in, this can happen to you. Mother Nature at her best. I'm going to repair that, but I'll repair it with some glue and I'll probably run a screw through here far enough away from the edge that it won't split it just to make sure it holds it down but you got to deal with stuff like that if it's going to be outside every now and then you got to go out there and you got to make some repairs replace the top you know or, or uh, replace us or fix a piece that split on you like that uh, let's see. now you can't see very well I was going to show you whether there's pith in these, I can't see them right now because they're, I actually put stain on the end grain uh, there even though nobody sees it, it helps protect it, you know. And it'll suck up the stain like crazy, the end grain will. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people uh, along those lines will actually use a couple, uh, like four pans, like aluminum pans, you know. <laughs> set it down in there but put it on a rock or something to keep it up off the bottom of the pan and just let it sit there and suck stain up into the wood as long as it wants to you know until it quits so. <laughs> oh the only other thing i want to show you Un untreated 
That actually came off my house. Okay? And that's a combination of dry rot and insect damage. A combination of the two. But stuff like this happens to untreated wood. It's not, not got any kind of resistance to rotting. You know? This happens to be dry rot because it wasn't uh, exposed directly to uh, moisture, but moisture still got up underneath the siding and then it dried out, you know, so you get fungus growth in there and then it starts rotting on it. So that's one reason you want to use a resistant wood, okay? And when they replaced this piece, I said, put a piece of pressure treated pine in there, you know. I don't want to have to deal with that issue again. So my, that's a corner, one corner of my wall, okay, but I haven't put pressure treated pine in there. That's pretty much it. Any questions? Good job. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you.